chemistry, a free radical is an atom, molecule, or ion that has at least one unpaired valence electron. This makes free radicals unstable and highly reactive. They steal electrons from any nearby substances that yield them. Free radicals include the reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide ion, and hydroxyl radical. The body generates free radicals as the inevitable byproducts of metabolism. Free radicals can also be formed after exposure to cigarette smoke, air pollution, and UV rays of sunlight. With high oxidative stress or the increased amount of free radicals in the body, it may cause damage to cells, DNA, RNA, and proteins, resulting to chronic illnesses and aging. Since the genetic information is damaged, it may then result to mutations that might cause cancers. But humans are not defenseless against free radicals. We can acquire free radical fighters from food known as antioxidants. They work by giving electrons to free radicals without turning into free radicals themselves. As a result, the free radicals will attack the antioxidants instead of damaging nearby cells and genetic material. In this video, we'll tackle the antioxidant activity of two natural antioxidants, namely vitamin C and glutathione. Vitamin C is an antioxidant and coenzyme in the formation of the protein collagen which makes up skin. It also improves the absorption of iron in the body. Vitamin C provides protection against oxidative stress-induced cellular damage by scavenging of free radicals. Vitamin C's ability to easily donate electrons makes it a highly effective antioxidant. As seen here, vitamin C has two forms, the reduced ascorbic acid form and the oxidized dehydroascorbic acid form. When vitamin C is oxidized, the hydrogens of the hydroxyl parts of ascorbic acid are removed, which will then be given to stabilize free radicals. Just remove one electron from these parts of ascorbic acid, and it is now called ascorbate. Ascorbic acid metabolism 1. Ascorbate peroxidase transfers one electron out of an ascorbate derivative. Thus, it either converts ascorbate to the ascorbyl radical or the ascorbyl radical to dehydroascorbate. Dehydroascorbate dehydrogenase converts dehydroascorbate to ascorbate. A two electron transfer. It gets the two electrons from the reduced form of glutathione, thus regenerating vitamin C to its reduced form. Ascorbate acid metabolism 2. If the ascorbyl radical does not get oxidized immediately by ascorbate peroxidase, it undergoes spontaneous, rapid disproportionation to form ascorbate and dehydroascorbate. Ascorbate metabolism 3 or ascorbate electron transport chain. Ascorbate is a major free radical scavenger in the blood. Ascorbate metabolism is tightly coordinated and intertwined with glutathione, hydrogen peroxide, and NADPH metabolism. Ascorbate is able to enter cells through GLUT1 or GLUT3 glucose transporter only in the form of dehydroascorbate. Most conversions between ascorbate derivatives are done in the peroxisome. Since it is water-soluble, it acts both inside and outside cells to protect molecules in aqueous environments. Vitamin C also functions to regenerate other antioxidants back in their reduced state. After substances such as folate and vitamin E have been used up or oxidized, vitamin C restores the hydrogen atoms they previously lost, allowing them to function longer. Water-soluble vitamins Vitamin C or ascorbic acid. This is the most heat labile vitamin. It acts as a strong reducing agent. Sources include citrus fruits, fresh vegetables, and amla or gooseberry being the richest source. Local concentration of vitamin C, pituitary gland being the greatest, then the adrenal cortex, and then the corpus luteum. The daily requirement is 100 milligrams per day. Biosynthesis and metabolism. 
Humans and other primates cannot synthesize ascorbic acid due to deficiency of a single enzyme, L-gulonolactone oxidase. It is rapidly absorbed from the intestine and excreted in the urine as ascorbic acid, or its metabolites diketogulonic acid and oxalic acid. Functions Vitamin C is required for wound healing. It is responsible for hydroxylation of proline and lysine in collagen, and oxidation of tyrosine and phenylalanine. It plays a key role in iron absorption by keeping iron in the ferrous state. Acid, because one of the hydrogen atoms is only loosely bound and can leave the rest of the molecule to bind to water. When the hydrogen departs, it leaves behind the two electrons that it was sharing with the oxygen, so the molecule is now negatively charged. This is now called ascorbate. Most of the function of vitamin C involves it donating one of those two electrons when they're needed. The negatively charged ascorbate loses one of the two electrons, leaving it with an unpaired electron, making it a free radical with no net charge. This is now called monodehydroascorbate. Let's look at some examples of vitamin C in action. The radical, in this case the hydroxyl radical, comes into contact with a lipid. It will rip a hydrogen ion and one electron off the lipid to create a lipid radical. Again, this is a radical because it has an unpaired electron. The problem with free radicals is that they are very reactive and can cause unwanted chemical reactions in the body. To try to reduce the damage done by the free radical, the body uses vitamin E to donate a hydrogen ion and an electron to the lipid radical, making it no longer a free radical. However, in the process, vitamin E itself becomes a free radical. This is an improvement on the previous situation, as the vitamin E radical is less reactive than the lipid radical, and therefore less likely to do damage. Now comes the role of vitamin C, which can donate an electron to the vitamin E radical, recycling the vitamin E and creating the vitamin C radical we met earlier, monodehydroascorbate. Then two molecules of monodehydroascorbate can react together to give dehydroascorbate and ascorbate, neither of which are radicals. This then eliminates the threat of damage by the free radical. We can acquire vitamin C mainly from dietary sources, namely citrus, such as oranges, kiwi, lemon, and grapefruit, bell peppers, strawberries, and cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, and spinach. It is advised to take vitamin C supplements if a person has scurvy or vitamin C deficiency. Also, it is advised if one is stuck in a poor diet, a diet without citrus fruits and cruciferous vegetables. The suggested amount of intake for 19 years old and above is 19 mg a day for men and 75 mg a day for women. For pregnancy and lactation, it is advised to take at least 120 mg a day. Smokers have lower vitamin C levels and a higher prevalence of deficiency than non-smokers due to enhanced oxidative stress. This is why their suggested amount of intake is higher than normal. For men, it is 125 mg per day and for women, it is 110 mg per day. Intake beyond 2,000 mg may promote gastrointestinal distress and diarrhea. Taking in large amounts of vitamin C may cause kidney stones in the form of calcium oxalate. Furthermore, absorption of vitamin C decreases by 50% when taking amounts greater than 1,000 mg. Glutathione, known as the master antioxidant, is present in significant combinations in most cells, protecting cellular content from free radicals such as parasites and superoxides. Just like vitamin C, Glutathione also functions to recycle other antioxidants back in their reduced states, namely vitamin C and E, as well as alpha lipoic acid and coenzyme Q1. Glutathione has two forms, its reduced and oxidized form. Please take note that the reduced form of glutathione is its active form. 
you can see that upon oxidation, the hydrogens from the SH group of glutathione are removed and given to stabilize free radicals. After the reaction, two glutathione molecules will bond and a disulfide linkage will be formed. Glutathione reductase pathway Glutathione reductase is an enzyme whose goal is to reduce oxidized glutathione back to its active form. As we have encountered earlier, reduced glutathione is its active form. The oxidized glutathione, where it has disulfide linkage, will be reconverted by the enzyme glutathione reductase. How does the enzyme do it? It gives the hydrogen electrons that the glutathione previously lost through NADPH, produced by the HMP shunt. After NADPH is used, it turns to NADPH+. What will happen if cells lack NADPH? In certain conditions like G6PD deficiency, there is a decreased production of NADPH. As seen in the cycle here, NADPH is essential for the conversion of glutathione into its active form. Without it, there will be an increase in oxidative stress in the body since there is limited glutathione to neutralize free radicals. Even if a person has adequate amounts of inactive glutathione in their bodies, if it is not reactivated, its presence is useless. Meaning, it is a non-essential compound. We do not need to acquire glutathione from supplements since our body can create it in their own. Although glutathione plays a vital role in the body, the benefits are thought to be primarily due to the cysteine that helps form it. Other supplements such as N-acetylcysteine may provide the cysteine needed to raise glutathione levels in the body in a less expensive way. The tripeptide glutathione is composed of three amino acids namely glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine. What can you observe from the building blocks of glutathione? Glutathione contains cysteine which is one of the two sulfur-containing standard amino acids. Notably, sulfur is required for the synthesis of glutathione. Ingestion of appropriate amino acids and sulfur-containing foods will increase the production of glutathione in the liver. It is supported by a number of human and animal studies discovering how eating sulfur-rich vegetables may reduce oxidative stress by increasing glutathione levels. Some of the foods high in sulfur are unprocessed meat like beef, fish, and poultry, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, watercress, and mustard beans, and allium vegetables like garlic, shallots, and onions, asparagus, avocados, and spinach. Factors affecting glutathione production. First, we have age. Young, healthy people tend to have enough glutathione. However, glutathione levels start to decline at around age 45 and continue to decline until death. Glutathione production seems to decrease as people age. Lower glutathione levels appear to go hand-in-hand -hand with poor health. For instance, lower levels may play a role in many conditions that are more likely to develop in older people. Next, we have lifestyle factors. Cigarette smoking and excessive alcohol intake cause a decrease in glutathione in the body. This may be due to an increase in free radical production, thus depleting glutathione levels. In conclusion, when we are already eating a balanced diet, there is no need to take vitamin C and glutathione supplements. Note that even though they are antioxidants, too much of everything will always be harmful and detrimental to one's health. Vitamins are only needed in different amounts, unlike the macromolecules, carbohydrates, and foods. So there is no need to take potent amounts of vitamins. According to Harvard School of Public Health 2020, many studies on antioxidant supplements do not show health benefits. This may be because antioxidants tend to work best in combination with other nutrients and antioxidants. 
This means that no single antioxidant can neutralize all free radicals in the body. Taking antioxidants such as vitamin C and glutathione will not automatically prevent cancer, chronic diseases, and aging. For us to have a healthy body, we must regularly acquire various antioxidants from healthful sources, not just vitamin C and glutathione.